So it's my uh, privilege uh, to get to introduce um, <clears throat> our first um, uh, ESI speaker. Uh, so Michael Peluso is going to uh, lead off the day. Again, as Monica mentioned, we want to pair an ESI investigator with each visiting um, a senior faculty member. And, and, and Mike is um, uh, the perfect uh, person uh, to um, uh, give the uh, lead-in talk for Bob Silicano. Mike um, uh, uh, had uh, done his um, uh, medical school at Yale where he worked with Serena Spudich, um, who many of you know uh, here in the room, uh, went on to do a, a residency at Brigham. And we're lucky enough to get him as an ID fellow here at UCSF. He's now in his third year of ID fellowship. And just a little bit about this guy's productivity. So before he got here, he had already published uh, some 21 papers. Um, as a fellow in just a, a year and a half of his clinical, uh, uh, of his, um, uh, clinical research, um, uh, he's published an additional eight manuscripts. Um, uh, and uh, his focus now is on uh, HIV cure, um, uh, characterizing what a true functional cure is, and then uh, ideally developing interventions to achieve functional cure. Uh, and uh, he's um, also uh, has a new paper out in, in JCI Insight, which he's going to uh, talk about, which um, uh, represents a collaboration with our guest, uh, Bob Silicano. So without any further ado, uh, Michael Peluso. Thanks, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. The title of my brief talk today uh, is Differential Decay of Intact and Defective Proviral DNA in Individuals with HIV on Suppressive ART. And I want to begin by just acknowledging the study team listed at the bottom of the slide. And you'll note that Dr. Silicano, our speaker today, who is an important part of that study team. The latent HIV reservoir is established early in the course of infection, persists despite suppressive ART, and is quite dynamic. And understanding variability between individuals and the rate of change of the reservoir size will be really important for interpreting interventions me meant to induce an HIV cure. But prior assays that have been used to measure the re reservoir face major limitations. So, if the, the size of the replication competent, clinically relevant reservoir is indicated in blue here, you'll see the limitations of, of typical reservoir assays. The quantitative viral outgrowth assays indicated in green are quite time and labor intensive, and they tend to underestimate the reservoir size because they require a step in which cel cells are stimulated and not all cells will be stimulated. In contrast, in red uh, is what would happen if you measure total HIV DNA. And so you can see that this vastly overestimates the size of the replication competent reservoir because you're detecting a great deal of defective proviruses that are not replication competent and not clinically relevant. The intact proviral DNA assay, or IPDA, was developed with the limitations of these existing assays in mind. And I don't have time to go through the details of the assay, but uh, I will say that it simultaneously analyzes through a PCR reaction, both the five prime and three prime end of the DNA strand. And so as an output, you get a four quadrant plot in which uh, dots in quadrant two are amplifying from both the five prime and the three prime end of the strand. And that means that they are likely to be intact and therefore more likely to be replication, comp replication competent. In contrast, the dots that end up in quadrants one, three, and four either have a five prime or three prime deletion or don't amplify at all. And these are likely to be defective. And so you can see that the IPDA um, more accurately measures the, the blue circle that we want to quantify here. But the degree that the, to which the intact reservoir decays during ART remains unknown. And so in this project, we analyzed CD4 T cells from longitudinal PBMC samples from participants on suppressive ART in the SCOPE cohort. And these individuals had been on ART for a median of 7.3 years. And we hypothesized that intact and defective proviruses would demonstrate different rates of change and that the rate of change would correlate with markers of immune status like CD4 nadir or the most recent CD4 count. 
And to do this, we did mathematical modeling using linear spline models, which allowed for the rate of change to slow after a specified duration of time. So you can see in the red line here, that would be a global rate of change, just kind of connecting multiple points, whereas the models that we used um, are indicated in blue, and they have a, a cut point at which the slope can change. We fit various models, and the optimal placement of that cut point or not was at seven years. This slide represents the primary results of the project. Uh, so intact and defective provirus decayed at different rates as we hypothesized. So I'll take you through these plots. So um, in each plot, the x-axis shows the years since the individual uh, achieved virologic suppression. And the y-axis shows the size of the reservoir as measured using the IPDA. And then each of the light gray lines in the background of these plots re represent all of the data for each individual, and the dark color lines represent the fitted model. So in the first graph in red, you can see that during the first seven years, uh, there was a 16% per year decay in the size of the reservoir, the intact reservoir, and that corresponds with a half-life of about four years. And then after that cut point at seven years, there's a 3.6% per year decay in the reservoir, and that corresponds with a half-life of 19 years. The graph in purple shows the combined defective provirus population. There's a 4.3% per year decay during the first seven years, which corresponds with a half-life of 16 years. And following the cut, cut point at seven years, there's a 1.5% per year decay, uh, which corresponds with a half-life of 47 years. This is the second primary result of this study, which is that the rate of decline course, during the first seven years on ART corresponds, um, uh, correlates with the various immunologic measures that I mentioned at the beginning. So this uh, figure shows the CD4 nadir, the CD4 count at the beginning of therapy, and the CD4 to CD8 ratio, which is a marker of immunologic health. And you can see that for all of these measures, um, there is a, a correlation between um, the robustness of the immune system uh, with the rate, of, uh, the rate of change in the intact reservoir size. We also looked at other parameters like age, race, gender, duration of infection, and these had no substantial effects on the rate of change of the intact reservoir. So the key findings of this study uh, are that the model estimates that over 200 years of effective ART would be needed to achieve a four log reduction in the levels of intact proviral DNA, that intact and defective proviruses exhibited different rates of decay during the first seven years on therapy, and that individuals with higher CD4 nadirs had a faster rate of decay of intact provirus. There are a number of follow-up projects that we've, um, we've initiated based on these results, and this includes looking at correlates of rapid decay with our colleagues at the Gladstone, looking over longer periods of time, so individuals have been on ART for over a decade, evaluating individuals who began treatment during acute or early HIV infection and also in our elite controller cohort, and then really implementing this assay in the context of immunotherapy trials. So, in summary, this assay is really becoming the gold standard for measuring the intact reservoir, and I think this project um, provides an important point of reference for future studies. I'd like to acknowledge everybody uh, listed on this slide, and particularly to acknowledge Dr. Silicano's group at Hopkins and the folks at Accelivir Diagnostics who performed the assay. Um, and of course, we're grateful to our scope study participants. Thank you. changes um, the slope of decline? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't have a good answer to that question in terms of biologically what's happening. Um, I think that it'll be really informative to look over longer periods of time um, in individuals who've been on ART for over a decade, for example, and see um, if the models look similar uh, or if there's kind of an additional cut point. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Um, so you could imagine that either um, the virus itself, uh, due to protein expression, uh, has cytopathic effects or enhanced clearance by the immune system, which occurs earlier in time, and that that might decline over time. There are a number of mechanisms that you could postulate, and I think those are all worth investigating. Yeah, so uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Robert Silicano. Dr. Silicano is a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor of medicine and molecular biology and genetics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He earned his MD and PhD from Johns Hopkins and completed postdoctorate work at Harvard Medical School before joining the faculty at Hopkins. And over the last 25 years, he's made major contributions to understanding uh, HIV pathogenesis and the HIV reservoir. His work in the 90s demonstrated that HIV causes latent infection of memory CD4 T cells. He was the first to show that HIV persists indefinitely, that ART alone cannot be curative, and that the immune system during treatment is ineffective at clearing the reservoir. He also was the first to describe in detail the potency of ART and how these agents affect viral activity. He went on to discover that the vast majority of the virus that persists is, in fact, defective, and developed the assay which has now become the gold standard for measuring the reservoir in HIV cure studies. The importance of Dr. Silicano's work can really not be overstated. He has fundamentally changed how we think about and treat HIV infection and has informed how we might achieve a cure. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Dr. Silicano on the project that I presented this morning. And in addition to being one of the most prominent scientists in the field, Dr. Silicano has a reputation for being exceedingly thoughtful, kind, and encouraging to young investigators. I learned a great deal from him through our collaboration on that project, and I'm honored to welcome him to UCSF today. Thanks very much, uh, Michael, for that, that really uh, kind introduction. Um, it's always a real honor to be um, invited to UCSF, where so much um, important work on uh, HIV um, has been done. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, barriers to cure. Um, and these are some uh, disclosures uh, uh, that are uh, relevant to, to an assay that, uh, that Michael mentioned that I'll uh, be describing. Uh, so uh, the principal barrier to cure, we think, is a latent reservoir that is established when activated uh, T cells become infected as they're transitioning back to a resting uh, memory uh, state. And a lot of work from uh, uh, many people, including people uh, here at uh, UCSF, uh, Warner Green and Matita Petterlin, um, showed that in uh, resting T cells, the transcriptional environment is really non-permissive for viral gene expression. And that's due to the fact that key host transcription factors like NF-kappa B and NFAT uh, and PTEF-B are either sequestered in the cytoplasm or are um, uh, locked up in uh, inactive complexes so that HIV transcription um, uh, uh, terminates uh, prematurely or, or doesn't uh, even initiate. And so um, when cells make this transition back to a resting state, uh, HIV gene expression is sort of automatically extinguished uh, and you end up with a uh, stably integrated but transcriptionally silent form of the virus in a memory T cell, which is of course uh, a cell that's designed to live a long time and provide uh, immunologic memory. Uh, uh, and the, this memory compartment is maintained by homeostatic uh, proliferation. Now, if one of these cells becomes activated uh, by antigen in the future, it can begin to produce virus. And so this is almost a perfect recipe for viral persistence because it allows the, the virus to persist essentially just as information, um, unaffected by uh, the immune response or by antiretroviral uh, drugs. And we know that these cells are present um, because initially um, uh, of a of an assay, a viral outgrowth assay, uh, that we use to, to, to detect them. And the assay is really based on this model. So to detect latently infected cells, you reverse latency uh, with T cell um, activation. Uh, and if you uh, plate uh, resting CD4 cells, which don't produce any virus, you plate them uh, in limiting dilution and then activate them with a mitogen, 
uh, cells with latent HIV can begin to produce virus and it spreads through the culture so that in about two weeks you can grow out from a single latently infected cell enough virus to detect by, a, by an ELISA assay and then go back and calculate the frequency. Uh, the frequency turned out to be extremely low, about one in a million, and this is a number that's really made our lives very difficult for the last uh, 25 years. This is a very small population of cells, hard uh, to study, uh, but the problem is that uh, uh, this population doesn't decay. So this is the decay rate uh, of uh, this population as measured with the viral outgrowth assay in patients who are doing well on ART, no uh, detectable free virus in the plasma. Um, and uh, my wife did this study, half-life was uh, uh, 44 months. Now this was a long time ago in sort of the earlier days of ART. Uh, recently David Margolis's group has repeated this work in uh, patients on uh, sort of more uh, uh, <coughs> state-of-the-art regimens um, and basically come up with exactly uh, the same half-life. So all of the tremendous improvements in antiretroviral therapy haven't actually impacted this fundamental problem of a non-replicating form of the virus. Uh, and this is really what we have to worry about. Now, another indication of viral persistence is a residual viremia. This is the trace level of free virus in the plasma of treated patients, below the limit of detection of uh, clinical uh, assays. Uh, and initially there was some concern that this might represent ongoing replication occurring despite uh, ART. Um, and in a series of papers that we published that, as far as I can tell, have never been read by anyone, um, we have tried to characterize uh, this residual viremia. And um, what we found was that um, it's archival in character. It's drug sensitive virus that continues to be released for years without any evolution. Uh, we saw no evidence of evolution. Um, and it's not affected by treatment intensification. If you add additional drugs, you can't reduce this resi residual viremia any further. And that's really because it's probably coming from the reactivation of latently infected cells. They produce virus that can't infect uh, new cells, but uh, which can be detected in the plasma with a sensitive enough uh, assay. Now, so this, in, in fact, me measuring residual viremia is one way to assess the reservoir, but this uh, assay is very, very difficult, and in most people it's uh, only about one copy per mil. So difficult to, to use as a, as, a, as a measure of the reservoir. But it did provide one very interesting clue. Um, this is uh, sequences from a single patient, sequences in resting CD4 cells um, uh, over about a two-year period. And here's the sequences from free virus in the plasma. Um, and sometimes they match um, consistent with the idea that the residual viremia is coming from these latently infected cells. Um, but um, I'm going to show you the rest of this phylogenetic tree. What was really surprising, uh, probably one of the most uh, shocking things that I've ever observed in my, in my career, was that in this patient and about half the people we studied, the residual viremia was dominated by a single sequence. And we spent about two years convincing ourselves that this was not some kind of a weird artifact. So, so basically, um, these are multiple independent limiting dilution amplifications detecting um, the same sequence without a single nucleotide change over about a two-year um, period. Um, and the only way to explain this is to say that um, this reflects the proliferation of an infected cell, which would copy the viral genome without error into all the progeny cells. Um, and so we thought this must reflect sort of extensive proliferation of infected cells. Uh, the cells we want to eliminate um, are actually able to proliferate in vivo. And I'm going to come back to this problem in a moment. These are some other examples of what we call these predominant uh, plasma clones. Um, so, but first I want to um, talk about, uh, th this result actually suggests that um, the drugs are working well enough to completely stop viral replication. And a lot of people had a hard time believing this. Um, and what really gave us confidence uh, in believing this was work, really brilliant work done by Lin Shen, who is now an assistant professor here in rheumatology. Um, and Lin looked at the dose response curves of antiviral drugs, which you um, can display like this with infection going down as the concentration of the drug increases. Uh, you can describe this curve with a simple mathematical expression. This is basically the median effect equation that relates the effect of the drug to the dose or drug concentration, the IC50, and this exponent m, which is the Hill coefficient. It's a, a measure of the slope or steepness of the curve. Uh, and uh, this is analogous to um, the Hill coefficient in biochemistry, which is usually a measure of cooperativity, for example, oxygen binding to hemoglobin. Uh, people don't pay much attention to this because the drugs we use to treat HIV infection 
um, are, are interacting with uh, uh, targets that are monovalent with respect to the inhibitor. So no sort of cooperativity was, was expected. And if you look at the effect of the slope parameter, um, it looks like a higher value of the slope parameter. It doesn't really change these curves very much. Um, uh, they all sort of come together, um, and especially at concentrations above the IC50 where you would use the drugs. Um, but this is only because the way pharmacologists uh, plot the dose response curve is really inappropriate for antiviral drugs because viruses replicate exponentially. So really what you should do is use a logarithmic uh, y-axis here. And if you simply transform the y-axis, uh, the same curves look like this. Uh, so actually drugs with higher values of the slope parameter produce much more inhibition by orders and orders of magnitude. So by this analysis, this value of the slope parameter is, is, should be actually the key parameter for antiviral drugs uh, when infectivity is the readout. And shockingly, nobody knew what the value of the slope parameter was for HIV drugs. Uh, so Lynn measured this, uh, showed that actually for some classes of drugs, the slope uh, was much higher than uh, one, and this actually translates into many, many logs of inhibition at uh, clinical concentrations. Uh, the best PIs actually can produce a 10 billion fold inhibition of a single round of replication um, at CMAX. So uh, basically antiviral drugs have a much greater ability, I think, to block viral replication than we thought because of this kind of unexpected cooperativity. And uh, where you see this now is, has also been applied to hepatitis C drugs. Uh, they have the same kind of steep dose response curves and of course we can cure hepatitis C infection in 12 weeks. Uh, the big difference being, of course, uh, there's no latent uh, form uh, to worry about. So we really have to figure out how to get rid of this latent uh, form. And, and to do that, um, we've got to be able to measure it accurately. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about measurement um, and actually how, me how just finding a better way to measure the reservoir has really given us some remarkable insights into uh, what its uh, composition and dynamics are. So, so this is the original assay, which uh, basically nobody wants to do. It's about two or three weeks of tissue culture work uh, in a BSL-3 lab. Um, and even though it always works, most people have resorted to simpler PCR assays to measure the provirus. Uh, and in a study that uh, my wife Janet did along with Steve Deeks, um, uh, they compared this viral outgrowth assay to various PCR-based assays and showed that the PCR assays give infected cell frequencies that are about 300-fold higher than the viral outgrowth assay and, and really poorly correlated with the viral outgrowth assay. And then um, uh, Yachi Ho and our group provided an explanation for uh, this uh, discrepancy uh, by doing a uh, single genome, a full-length sequencing of HIV proviruses. And uh, what she found was that most proviruses are defective with large internal deletion shown here in white or hypermutation uh, shown in green. Intact proviruses uh, shown in orange are actually uh, very rare. Uh, and you can see why using uh, simple uh, DNA PCR assays, which are sort of the most common uh, assay now used to measure the reservoir, actually is a, is a terrible way to assess uh, the reservoir because um, you simply miss defects that are encompassing or outside of the region uh, amplified. So now we've also looked in uh, SIV, uh, SHIV, and HIV2, and the same, uh, we see the same kinds of patterns with lots of deletions and lots of uh, hypermutation. And just to go a little bit into the molecular details of these defects, uh, this is the length of the deletions uh, for uh, SIV. It's similar for HIV. You can see that many of the deletions actually encompass large chunks of the genome. Actually, the average size of these deletions is half the genome, half genome length, and that will become important. Um, these um, deletions arise during reverse transcription by a premature uh, template switching event. And uh, the reason we know that is you can see at the deletion junctions regions of homology um, that are uh, responsible for this through a mechanism that um, is described uh, by Vinay Patak here, a premature template switching mechanism. Now, um, the hypermutation also occurs during reverse transcription mediated by APOBEC3G uh, or 3F. Uh, and this is uh, hard to see here, but each horizontal, each vertical slash is a single G to A mutation introduced by these uh, host enzymes in a hypermutated uh, provirus. Um, 
and this is, occurs in two sort of gradients, uh, ref really reflecting the mechanism of reverse transcription. Um, but what's really uh, surprising to me is the fraction of the Gs that are mutated. Um, so this is the percent of all the Gs in the genome uh, that are mutated uh, to A. Uh, and in SIV, which is a little bit higher than HIV, but you can see that in some cases over 40% of the Gs, that's about 1,000 Gs mutated to A. So, so these um, mutations introduce lots of stop codons. Every open reading frame typically has uh, stop codons. So these viruses are completely dead for replication. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense to include them in, in measurements of uh, the reservoir. Um, so these are the nature of the defects. I want to put this all in perspective. Um, this is the uh, size of the infected cell population that would, you would measure with a standard gag PCR. Um, typically about 1,000 cells per million. The viral outgrowth assay is one per million. Uh, and most of this difference is due to these defective proviruses that I, that I mentioned. But I think probably the most important thing that Yachi discovered was that there's actually um, a significant number of proviruses that are intact at the primary sequence level that have no obvious uh, defects. And here the frequency we estimated about 100 per million. And we need to know, uh, do we need to worry about all of these or not, or just uh, these ones that we detect uh, by viral outgrowth. Uh, Yachi showed that these intact proviruses have functional LTRs that are not methylated. Um, they're typically integrated into genes that are expressed in T cells. Um, and when you reconstruct them, they replicate uh, normally. So nothing to indicate that they could not potentially uh, turn on in vivo and cause uh, viral rebound. So to determine whether they actually could uh, be induced, we've carried out experiments in which we take um, culture wells that are negative for viral outgrowth and simply recover the cells and subject them to additional rounds of T cell activation. And even though all of the cells proliferate in these kind of cultures, uh, some of the cells don't produce virus until after a second or a third or even a fourth round of T cell activation. So what it really looks like is this. With each round of T cell activation, you induce additional uh, proviruses. And this uh, really represents a significant problem for uh, reservoir measurement, particularly uh, measures like the viral outgrowth assay or the tilde assay that depend on a single round of T cell activation to induce uh, viral gene uh, expression. It's also a very significant problem for the shock and kill strategy. It says that even a, a maximal T cell, a single round of maximum T cell activation in which every T cell uh, be becomes activated and proliferates doesn't turn on all of the latent proviruses. And so this gave us the idea that perhaps the best way to measure the reservoir was to measure the total number of intact proviruses um, regardless of their transcriptional status at any uh, given uh, point in time. And so we've attempted uh, to do that. Um, and we started, to do this, we started with a database of uh, near full genome uh, 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 sequences. If you look um, on a gene by gene basis uh, at these sequences, it turns out that most of these defective proviruses are defective in most viral genes. Um, this is a fraction of the genes that are defective. Um, and for protein coding genes, this is due to the deletions or uh, uh, stop codons introduced by uh, the ApoBec enzymes. There's also splicing defects. Um, and so uh, for uh, critical viral genes like TAT, which is required for high level of virus gene expression, um, uh, something like 95% of uh, provir defective proviruses are defective in TAT. So their in vivo biology uh, might be expected to be very different from cells uh, with intact proviruses. Another reason why it doesn't make sense to measure them together. You should really separately measure uh, the intact uh, proviruses. Um, so it turns out to be relatively easy to do that by digital droplet PCR where you take DNA from infected cells and distribute it into a nanoliter sized droplet such that no droplet gets more than a single provirus. And then you can interrogate um, uh, each provirus with multiplex PCR uh, reactions occurring within uh, the droplet. Um, it turned out uh, with just two reactions, we could uh, distinguish most deleted provirus from, proviruses from intact proviruses uh, using an amplicon in the, the packaging signal, which is the frequent site of small deletions um, at the five prime end, um, and one in the uh, envelope gene. Uh, as well. And, and the reason this works is because, as I said, most of the deletions are large, half genome length. So if you have amplicons at either end of the genome, you're going to catch most of the deletions. Uh, now this um, 
uh, three prime amplicon um, uh, also uh, includes a, re a conserved region in the rev responsive element where there are two adjacent uh, APOBEC 3G consensus sites that are hypermutated in 95% of hypermutated proviruses. And these are just some of the patterns of hypermutation that we see and we developed uh, discrimination probes that would allow us to distinguish intact from hypermutated proviruses in this uh, region. So this led to the assay that, that, that Michael described, what we call the intact proviral DNA assay. So here's DNA from infected cells distributed into these droplets. Um, and here's a provirus which you can uh, simultaneously interrogate it, just two positions. Um, and then uh, the data are displayed uh, on a 2D plot, as, as Michael mentioned, with fluorescence from the packaging signal amplicon on the y-axis and the envelope uh, on the uh, x-axis. So, um, Proviruses with a deletion at the three prime end will only give fluorescence with this packaging signal amplicon and show up in the upper left quadrant. And uh, this is also where the hypermutated proviruses show up because that's where the hypermutation discrimination probe is. Uh, proviruses with a five prime deletion um, show up in the lower right quadrant. And then in the, the rare uh, intact proviruses, which you can see better um, here, show up in the upper a right quadrant and can be directly counted. So this is direct counting, absolute counting of uh, proviruses. Uh, and I think this is one of the, the real values of this assay over uh, other uh, methods that depend on, uh, for example, normalization with uh, uh, standard curves. This is direct absolute quantitation. Uh, so the assay also has a, um, a similar assay for a cellular gene that allows us to determine the cell equivalence and control for DNA shearing, uh, there's some analytics, and the output is uh, intact proviruses per million um, cells. Now the background with HIV negative um, DNA is extremely clean, there's no, dot, no dots. Um, uh, so you can uh, do very nice gating. Um, and occasionally um, we do see uh, situations where one of the amplicons uh, fails. So in this case uh, there's no um, uh, envelope positive droplets. This is due to a polymorphism. Um, that affects this uh, amplicon. Overall, the frequency of amplicon failure is about um, 7% in our hands. Uh, and in this case, alternative primers are required to measure the number of intact proviruses. The nice thing is that um, in these situations, um, the, the problem is readily uh, obvious. And this is an advantage over single amplicon uh, types of uh, systems because in, that, in those cases, you can't distinguish amplicon failure from simply low template uh, number. Um, so we think that this assay is a scalable alternative to the standard GAG PCR assay that gets us a lot closer to the number of intact proviruses. Um, there are some proviruses that score as intact in this assay that have small uh, defects. Um, but this, I think, gets us a lot closer to what we really want to measure, uh, the number of intact uh, proviruses. And um, we've now, as, as Michael has shown very nicely, we've used this in large uh, patient cohort studies. Uh, initially, this is our results in the initial uh, paper for intact and defective proviruses. The number of in uh, intact proviruses turned out to be 100 per million on average, which is exactly what we predicted based on the full genome sequencing, um, and a lot lower than the number of cells with defective proviruses. And this is the first evidence uh, from a method that doesn't depend on long distance PCR that the landscape of proviruses is dominated by defective proviruses. And this is important because the initial method that Yachi developed and, and has subsequently sort of used and modified by many other groups depends on a 9 KB PCR, which we now know is extremely, almost shockingly inefficient. So um, what, you, what you get from those kinds of experiments is, is if you get something, then, then you have it, but you never know what you didn't get. So I think in terms of measurement and quantitation, it's much better to use short, highly efficient uh, amplicons as is done um, in this assay. There's a pretty good correlation with the viral outgrowth assay, even though um, the ratio between the IPDA value and the of viral outgrowth assay in the same patient is 100 to 1. Again, this is what we had expected based on the full genome uh, sequencing. But this really, I think, points to what is the key problem, and that is the fact that there's a lot more of these intact proviruses than we detect in a single round of in vitro T cell activation with the viral outgrowth assay. And this is a fundamental problem, this problem of inducibility that I'll, that I'll come back to. Uh, and we looked in uh, paired blood and lymph node samples from the same patient and about the same uh, frequencies. Um, so uh, with uh, Raj Gandhi, we've looked in over time 
in patients on ART, uh, two time points separated by about four years. Uh, and you can see that uh, repeat measurements in the same patient are highly correlated. Uh, dots that fall below this line represent decay between the first time point and the second time point four years later. And you can see most patients fall on a line that represents about 44 months, uh, what was expected from the viral outgrowth assay. But as you can do larger numbers of patients, you can begin to see outliers, and we're very interested in what might cause rapid decay or uh, increases in the reservoir. This is likely due to proliferation. And I'll just give you one other example, uh, interesting example of the use of this assay in large cohorts. So this is a, a cohort of patients with a history of injection drug use in Baltimore. Um, uh, who are either not using currently or are currently using heroin, cocaine, or both. Uh, we were pretty surprised to see that the size of the reservoir as measured by this assay was pretty much the same in these groups, uh, about 100 uh, per million. Uh, what did um, stand out as significant was patients with a history of going on and off ART due to um, uh, what we call non-structured treatment interruption, interruptions did have a significantly higher uh, uh, reservoir um, size. Okay, so, so this is, a, a, we hope, a way to um, improve on reservoir measurement, uh, but now I think we come to the really hard problem, and that is understanding what is this difference, uh, the difference between uh, cells we detect in the viral outgrowth assay and the total number of cells with intact uh, proviruses. Um, we know, as I mentioned, that if you uh, do repeated stimulation, you can bring out additional uh, proviruses, and does this reflect uh, some kind of stochastic effect where uh, each round of uh, activation has a certain probability of inducing a provirus, as suggested by Lira Weinberger, or uh, are there cells that are in a sort of so-called deeper state of latency? This is something that Rafiq Sekli has been uh, suggesting, uh, related to sort of canonical T cell um, subsets. And so we've looked at this, um, starting with resting T cells and sorting them using conventional uh, markers that are used to define the central and effector memory um, subsets. Um, and then taking the sorted cells and putting them into this multiple stimulation assay where you um, recover cells after each round of stimulation and, and half the cells get an additional stimulation and the other cells are cultured uh, for three weeks to look for viral outgrowth. And so in this way you can determine how many rounds of T cell activation do you need to turn on a latent uh, provirus. Um, IPDA analysis on the starting population showed higher levels in uh, memory cells than in naive cells. This is, I think, expected. Uh, but no real difference between the canonical memory cell subsets. Um, and in talking with, with Rafiq, he had um, suggested to us that what we might see in these kind of experiments is that virus would be readily induced uh, after the first stimulation in effector memory cells, but uh, require more stimulation in central memory cells, perhaps allowing these cells to differentiate towards a effector memory uh, phenotype. Uh, actually, what we saw was no pattern at all, tremendous variation from patient uh, to patient. Uh, and in terms of overall inducibility, um, not a real clear difference, tremendous overlap. When we normalize by uh, the IPDA, there is a uh, number of proviruses in the starting population, uh, perhaps slightly higher inducibility with effector memory cells, but again, a pretty significant uh, overlap. So in, in, in thinking about why uh, this subset analysis was mo not more informative, oh, and so I forgot to mention, the really important point is that uh, for all the subsets, even after multiple stimulations, the fraction of uh, uh, intact proviruses that are induced is still less than 10%. So this problem of inducibility, I think, is really um, something that we have to, 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 to understand. Now, one of the problems with understanding this um, the biology of these subsets is that the markers used to define the subsets change upon T cell activation. Uh, so for example, uh, CCR7 goes up on transitional and effector memory cells as soon as you activate the cells. So unless you start with resting cells, the data are essentially uninterpretable. Um, and this is a caveat in I would say most of the studies um, in the literature. And then if you look by single cell RNA-seq um, at uh, whether or not these canonical markers actually define uh, subsets that you can pick out looking at the whole transcriptome? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so in these experiments, these are actually activated cells and these are uh, resting cells and using CD45 um, uh, uh, con antibodies conjugated with oligos, we can define the CD45 RO population, so uh, memory cells. Um, and then look at CCR7, uh, which is on uh, naive cells and central memory cells. Um, and then look at 
the CCR7 positive, CD45, RO positive cells, which are here in yellow, they don't actually form a distinct uh, cluster in this kind of analysis. So I think we really need to sort of rethink how we're defining these memory cell um, subsets. And I don't think that has given us much insight, unfortunately, into this problem of inducibility. So how else can we explain uh, this uh, sort of low inducibility? Well, uh, some of these intact proviruses undoubtedly harbor small defects that we can't pick up, even by full genome sequencing. Um, um, some of them may be permanently silenced due to epigenetic uh, mechanisms, but whether that sort of permanent silencing would really be permanent and lifelong, um, very hard to know. So I think while we're sorting all of this out, um, I would advocate that it's certainly better to try and measure the number of intact proviruses than to sort of look at the whole uh, landscape, most of which are profoundly uh, defective, and I, in my opinion should be excluded from uh, reservoir measurements. So I want to return now in, in the, the time that remains to this um, problem of proliferation, which is really related to measurement uh, and to inducibility in, in ways that I'll um, describe. So the residual viremia, the, the, its clonal nature provided the first clue to this uh, concept of infected cell proliferation. And then a definitive evidence came from uh, integration site studies, um, but um, those studies generally um, capture just the uh, very ends of the viral genome, so you don't know uh, whether uh, what you're looking at is, in fact, an intact or defective uh, provirus. Um, and in fact, uh, studies by Lily Cohn showed that most of the uh, uh, clones you detect by integration site analysis are actually defective. Uh, to determine whether cells with an intact provirus could proliferate, um, we and others have used a viral outgrowth assay and simply obtained many independent isolates of replication competent virus and, and sequenced them. Um, and what we found uh, is that um, in most cases, if you look at multiple isolates from a single blood sample, you see lots of identical sequences that are identical throughout the genome. Um, in this uh, case, 57 percent of independent isolates from a single blood sample had a matching sequence in the same blood sample. So that actually represents an enormous amount of clonal expansion to capture sister cells derived from the same infected cell in a single blood sample. Um, and this says that the, the reservoir is actually dominated uh, by clones. We used to think of it as a sort of a, a stable population of quiescent cells, but in fact, uh, it's dominated by large clones um, and probably many smaller ones that we uh, can't see at our level of sampling. And so we've looked at the dynamics of these clones over a two to three year period. Some of them, um, as shown in these colors, um, persist over two to three years, um, but others are seen only at a single time point and then uh, disappear on, on a scale, time scale of months uh, uh, to years. Uh, and so. Uh, sort of underlying this apparent stability of the reservoir is an extremely dynamic process in which individual clones are um, expanding uh, and contracting. And this raises a lot of really interesting uh, questions. So um, what are the stimuli driving the expansion? Of course, it, it could be uh, antigen or, or uh, homeostatic cytokines that, that maintain the memory compartment or as suggested in the original integration site papers, uh, some effect related to the site of integration, integration into a gene associated with cell proliferation or survival that was in some way uh, promoting uh, the proliferation of infected uh, cells. Um, is each cell in the reservoir capable of this enormous degree of clonal expansion? That's a very disturbing uh, thought. Uh, what causes the contractions? This is something we would uh, really like to know. Um, and how do we account for clone dynamics in reservoir assays? So all of the, the measures of the reservoir don't really give you any picture at all of this very complex dynamics that's going on. It just gives you the total uh, number of infected cells. And do the stimuli that drive proliferation induce viral gene expression? Because that would allow us to uh, at least target the infected cells uh, when they um, are driven to proliferate. So we've looked a little bit at this uh, last issue. Um, the data that Michael presented are actually um, suggestive in the sense that um, cells with an intact provirus appear to have a faster decay rate uh, than cells with defective proviruses. Um, and I think he's shown this very nicely. Um, uh, 
Um, however, this um, more rapid decay is really just the 44-month uh, half-life that we've been talking about all along. What, what's really going on is that the cells with defective proviruses just don't uh, show any um, decay at all. So this, uh, this difference is really uh, pretty subtle. And um, what we really need to know is um, during this decay, is there, are the cells susceptible to immune clearance? This um, suggests that there may be an effect, but to look at this in more detail, um, we've worked with Steve and Rebecca Ho to um, look at patients over a long period of time. Uh, these are patients who were sampled first after about a year, a year and a half on ART, and then um, seven or eight years later, uh, and looked by a single genome sequencing to see if we could see changes in the reservoir that would be selective, that would be reflective of some kind of selective pressure occurring perhaps when the cells were undergoing a proliferation. And this is all the whole genome sequence is done by uh, Annie Antar. Um, and if you look at sort of aggregated, uh, the number of cells or the fraction of cells with intact proviruses did decrease uh, over uh, this uh, time course. But um, the decrease is really not um, very dramatic. And in fact, um, the in cells with intact proviruses are shown in red here. Sometimes they decrease, sometimes they increase, uh, largely reflecting expansion of individual uh, clones. So this is a, a subtle effect. And we've also looked at um, CTL escape mutations. We've previously shown that a lot of viruses in the reservoir have CTL escape uh, mutations. So you might think that if there were any immune pressure acting on these cells over time, that uh, cells with escape um, mutations would increase um, in frequency. In fact, we saw essentially um, the opposite or essentially no real effect. Um, and then similarly looking at the fraction of cells that are present within uh, clonal populations, um, that does increase over time, as been shown um, uh, by a number of groups, including uh, uh, Lily Cohn. Um, but if you look at um, whether intact versus defective proviruses are more likely to be present in these large clones, um, what we see is, in fact, intact proviruses in this study were actually more likely to be present in these clones. So no evidence for selection against their clonal expansion. And then looking at uh, individual um, CTL epitopes, whether they were uh, had escape mutations. Again, we didn't really see any strong selection in terms of the cells that are able to undergo clonal uh, expansion uh, for uh, CTL escape mutations. Now, some of this could be due to the fact that the CTL response is simply not effective in, in patients uh, treated during chronic infection. Uh, we've also looked at elite controllers and essentially seen the same thing. So, so although uh, with a very precise assay, the IPDA, we can pick up uh, subtle differences between the dynamics of cells with intact and defective proviruses over long periods of time, um, we don't see really strong uh, evidence, at least in this small detailed study, uh, for these uh, selective pressure affecting either um, the persistence or clonal expansion of, of cells. So let me um, try to summarize what I've, I've tried to say. Um, most proviruses persisting in treated patients are highly uh, defective, and I think um, these um, defective proviruses should be excluded from reservoir assays when we're trying to evaluate cure strategies. This intact proviral uh, uh, DNA assay is one way to do this. The low fraction of uh, intact proviruses that are induced by a single round of maximum T cell activation really represents a challenge, not only in terms of measurement, but for eradication strategies based on the shock and kill uh, idea. Uh, the, this inducibility of intact proviruses is low in all memory subsets. Most cells in the reservoir are generated by proliferation, not by direct uh, infection. Um, and the differential dynamics of intact and defective proviruses um, that, that Michael described are, are evident in long-term studies um, of large cohorts with a precise um, assay. Uh, but single genome evidence doesn't really provide strong evidence for selection against cells with intact proviruses or cells with wild-type epitopes, either in terms of persistence or, or clonal expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and this suggests that the cells, may, uh, cells with an intact provirus may be able to proliferate, go through the cell cycle, without really turning on high-level viral uh, gene uh, expression. And that would be consistent with our in vitro studies uh, with this multiple stimulation assay, where it appears that um, cells could go through multiple rounds of T cell activation without producing virus, but retain the ability to produce virus on a subsequent round of T-cell uh, activation.
So these are uh, some of the challenges that I'm going to leave you with. Unfortunately, I'm not going to leave you with any solutions to these uh, problems. I um, want to uh, thank people involved in this work. I've been working on this problem with my wife Janet for many years and she's really responsible for a lot of the, uh, the critical uh, studies. Uh, she's the one who's in the lab actually doing the work while I'm, as she likes to say, uh, I'm sort of sitting in my office eating donuts um, and um, uh, going around and giving talks. Um, uh, uh, Yachi Ho did all of the uh, uh, work on uh, defective proviruses. Katie Brunner and Greg Leard uh, developed the IPDA assay. Nina Hosmani and Jennifer Kwan did the work on proliferation. Uh, Alex Bender did the SIV work. And I should have put uh, Lynn Shen's picture in here, but she did all the work on uh, HIV pharmacodynamics um, a while back. I um, uh, want to thank many collaborators. A lot of this work was, um, in fact, almost all of this work was made possible by collaboration with Steve Deeks um, and Rebecca Ho. Um, Steve has been a remarkable uh, collaborator and contributor to HIV research. Um, he's probably too modest to tell you, but it was recently honored by an election to the Association of American Physicians, a, a real uh, reflection of his uh, distinguished contributions to uh, HIV uh, research. Uh, you guys are uh, lucky to have him and um, uh, we're lucky, the field is, is very lucky to have him and Rebecca. I uh, also want to thank Michael, very nice uh, to collaborate with Michael, Peter Hunt, Rick Heck, uh, Steve Yuko has been a great collaborator with work that I didn't have time to present. Um, lots of um, people in the SIV field have helped us and Greg Laird um, uh, is now um, running a startup company that's providing the IPDA assay um, in a highly sort of validated fashion for investigators in the field. And I want to thank funding uh, agencies. And I'll um, stop there. I'll be happy to uh, try and answer any questions. Uh, so we have about five minutes for questions. And I'm just going to ask you to wait until you receive a microphone to ask Mr. Monica. Hey, that was a great talk and I learned a lot that I didn't know um, and I'm sort of disturbed that we may not, I mean, about the proliferation. But I had a question about, could you explain what you said about the pharmacokinetics of the dose response with antiretrovirals and how there's a um, modeling that's maybe done on bacterial kinetics that is not true of viral kinetics when you think about antiretrovirals, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. Yeah, so, it, I mean, that's a great question. It's really interesting. If you look um, just at sort of enzyme activity um, of protease or reverse transcriptase, there's nothing special going on. Um, and n nothing was expected, oh, sorry, nothing was expected in terms of um, this uh, high value of the slope parameter or cooperativity because, you know, protease and, and RT have a single binding site for the relevant inhibitors. Um, but when the readout is infectivity, that is whether a cell gets infected or not, uh, which could require, let's say, the concerted action of multiple copies of protease or reverse transcriptase, um, then there is this kind of cooperativity. And um, it, because the viral replication is exponential and because this sort of operates on an exponential scale, it ends up producing very, very high levels of inhibition for some, of, some classes of HIV drugs. And I think this is going to turn out to be a characteristic of many viral infections and is certainly uh, showing uh, um, uh, the same, same patterns are showing up in um, HCV. Now in terms of uh, antibiotics and bacterial infections um, and how this would play out. That's a much more complicated issue that I don't really feel qualified to, to, compl to, to um, comment on. Okay, uh, great talk, thanks. So I was wondering if the IPDA to QVO ratio might be uh, a way to measure the effect effectiveness of latency reversal agents and if you compared those ratios across different ways of tickling the T cells. Yeah, so I think um, that's a, an important question and, and um, there, are, um, there is some effort to do that. We haven't um, done that uh, yet. The big, the big problem is that most latency reversing agents um, that are active in, let's say, model systems or in vitro models of latency don't actually work. In, in cells from patients. So, so we, you know, spent a long time looking at HDAC inhibitors and, uh, and, and um, other drugs that, that have been, you know, sort of touted as latency reversing agents and basically they don't work. Um, 
and if you look at induction of HIV RNA in cells from treated patients. The only class of agents that has any activity as single agents are um, protein kinase C agonists, which work a little bit. But so, so the problem, I think, is that we just don't have good, nothing really works. Now, there's, there are in vivo effects, for example, the SMAC medics have, you know, received a lot of attention lately, uh, doing something in vivo, inducing uh, viremia. When we look in vitro, ex vivo, I mean, with, with cells from patients, we don't see any induction of HIV RNA. So. Uh, so Hi, Bob. Great talk as always. Well, thank you thank so much. Um, I had a couple of questions at the end where you were showing that, you know, prim primarily the replication competent or the intact viruses predominated the clonal, you know, landscape you were seeing. Um, but yet the, you're not seeing any differences in the CTL escape. So based on that, is it, I mean, are you planning to do additional studies looking at more than T cell uh, pressure, for example, NK cells function? Or also, could it just be that because those cells, for whatever reason, they're proliferating more, um, that that's why they're making up the majority of what you're seeing? Because it's counterintuitive. I would have thought it'd be mostly defective, um, you know, based on your prior data and a lot of other literature out there. But one thing I was wondering is if you could go back into your single cell data that you already generated and see if particular gene sets, for example, related to proliferation could maybe indicate certain pathways that might be upregulated, suggesting that what's describing the majority being intact virus that you're seeing in these clonal clones um, might be explained by that aspect rather than those cells, you know, those individuals having some sort of escape mechanism. So, you know, and you could actually throw in pharmacology too, potentially some of the work you're doing there. Maybe, maybe there's, there's an aspect to that that's balancing that out as well. Um, and then, sorry, I had one other question as you were just talking. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That, that seemed like about five uh, questions. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> kind of unrelated, but, but, but the, the, I, I found the pharmacology that the, you know, the um, Hill coefficient that you showed was really fascinating because it made me think about some of the stuff we've been seeing in some of the NHP studies where you see sort of what we call in pharmacology um, hysteresis, where you sort of see this effect and then it kind of reaches a point and it stops having efficacy. Um, and that's with some of our cure agents, but it makes me wonder if that sort of same phenomenon, not just with ART, but given the fact that there's something different with viral dynamics and, and drug pressure, potentially if that could be also going on with some of these um, latency reversal data that we've been seeing. Yeah, so um, we haven't really applied that kind of analysis to um, latency reversing agents, um, again, partly because their, their activity is so horrible in our, in our system and with, with uh, primary cells. But, I mean, you know, the, 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 the work that Lynn did basically used the fundamental equations of uh, pharmacodynamics, so which, you know, really should be applied um, uh, to any uh, study of this kind and could be applied, and I don't know, um, I don't know what you'll see. In terms of um, your first uh, five questions, um, <laughs> I think uh, 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 the, the, the only one that I remember not right now was, uh, was uh, related to um, uh, patterns of gene expression. Um, I think um, in terms of looking at infected cells, Lily Cohn is probably the, the, the expert on that. It's, it's essentially, you know, exceptionally difficult uh, to do to look at um, uh, gene expression patterns in infected in lately infected cells, and, and, and Lily is, is um, um, I think, you know, making great progress on that. I think we're out of time, so join me in thanking Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you.